this one second. Okay, thank you for thank you, Prabhu. Okay, so um, so uh, so in the in the New Testament we see that this is full and final sacrifice, and because of that, something when we receive, when we invite, when we accept, the sun change that happens within in the spirit of man. Like that was not the case. That was not the case in the Old Testament. So just by observation, I'm 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 saying okay, uh, it's post the cross that the Holy Spirit, because of us being new creations and our spirit being born again, our spirit being alive uh, to the work of God, um, that He comes and indwells with us forever. So that's one observation. So that's that's one difference that we see in the Old Testament and the New, because they were there's a big difference, right? In the Old Testament saints, if you want to call them that, and the New Testament believers, this this was one major difference. They were looking towards the cross. Of course, they believed God, like it says about Abraham. Uh, he believed God; it was accounted to him for righteousness. Whereas we, we uh, we've been made born again. And Second uh, Corinthians five talks about the fact that he knew he made him who knew no sin to be sin, so that we become the righteousness of God. So it's no more accounted. Righteousness, but we become the righteousness of God in Christ, Christ Jesus. So there's a big difference. Um, yeah. So that's my thing. But it's 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 God's plan. It's God's purpose. Um, that's how He worked. Okay. So uh, coming back to this thing. So what is what are your thoughts? You know, when you look at this ministry of the world. Yeah. The Holy Spirit is. Hovering. Hmm. Right. He's already there. So, so in a sense, if you see, you know, he's already he's already present. You know, he's uh, he's omnipresent. Holy Spirit, he's omnipresent. You know? um, so you can't contain and. Uh, and the, and the fact is that uh, when the Lord says that He will send the Holy Spirit, it is with the specific intent of indwelling the believer. Like He will send the promise of the Father. You wait um, in Jerusalem, I will send the promise of the Father. It was for the first time that He would indwell a believer. Right? So that is why, you know, that's the thing. Uh, that is why He says He will send the promise. But the fact is that he was there. Like if you see, is God the Father here? I mean, yeah, he is. He's in heaven, but he's the fact that he's God, he's everywhere. Right? The Holy Spirit, yeah, he was there at creation, and uh, is, he, is he there? Yeah, of course he is. But the fact is the way he is in a believer, he's going to be there in a, in a way that he was not earlier. So he's saying, I will send the promise of the Father. Uh, when we read about the baptism of the Holy Spirit also, you know, we see that... Uh, See, when a believer is born again, he's already sealed with the Holy Spirit, right? He's, he's there. Uh, the Holy Spirit is already there. But then this baptism of the Holy Spirit is another experience for the believer, where he comes upon the believer in a, in a greater measure to take the believer uh, and to release certain things in a believer's life, to be witnessed with power, you know, what we see in Acts chapter 1. So does that mean the Holy Spirit is not there? Oh, he's there. He's indwelling because that's how we know. Okay, suddenly we become, you know, oh, I'm sensitive to sin. I, I should live a holy life. All that is because of the work of the Holy Spirit. But then, in baptism, in baptizing the believer, uh, he is. He comes upon the believer in a different measure um, to take the believer and to release certain things in the believer's life. So, so that's the thing. So it does not mean that he's not there and he suddenly is there. He is there, but he's doing a different work. Okay. Uh, online folks, um, any thoughts from your side? Okay, these were a couple of questions um, here, but um, what are your thoughts? You know, looking at the entire journey um, of the Old Testament and through the Old Testament, the work of the Holy Spirit. And you also. Yeah. Uh, 
absolutely right so so what uh, okay we have another dina here <laughs> there's a nina nina here also uh, what is your full name nina santosh okay there's nina john also here on my class okay so um, so what nina is saying is that um, it's it's a privilege because uh, it's something that the old testament saints did not have because we have the indwelling presence of the holy spirit 24/7 365 days right not a moment where he's not there so it's such a privilege for us we have we can any time call upon god we see in the old testament they will say hey i want to hear from god uh, let us go to a seer let us go to a prophet and let us inquire of the lord what what god's you know thoughts are because they were clueless they had the law they had the scriptures but they were clueless of what is what would god want in this particular thing right so for us we have the awesome privilege of you know so the thing is this you know only um only when we uh right when we let's say uh, how should i say it you know uh, if we do not have let's say because of sin okay because of living a life of rebellion and you know cutting off uh, you know, in the sense being hardened to the work of the holy spirit and then coming back you know we realize that oh this is what i this is what i really missed right you realize the worth or you know you you couldn't hear the voice of god and suddenly you hear the voice of god and and, and such an awesome uh, you know awesome privilege and, and it's also such a wonderful uh, gift and uh, god is with you and god wants to lead you and god wants to be involved in you know every aspect of your life right okay okay some here um okay the holy spirit is always at work enabling uh, people uh, and empowering people prabhu says that and then uh, trisha um only through the holy spirit prophets and kings in the old testament were able to perform god's mighty work yeah right okay so this this there is more there is much more for us as believers now that's all we can see akara anointing oil yeah Sorry, in the Old Testament. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a. So we see that. Um, okay, so Karen is asking, you know, about the anointing oil, and it was a, I, uh, the the reference is there in. Uh, I think. Uh, oh, it's there in the notes. Um, I don't uh, remember it um, off offhand, but uh, yeah, the fact is this. Okay, this anointing oil was used. and the, the tabernacle was there and everything that ha happened in the tabernacle um you know the uh, the sacrifice that happened uh, and you'll be learning about it in the you know praise and worship session also um this whole journey from the outer courts to the holy of holies and and the, how the high priest would do that once a year to the holy of holies etc so um what was that right so that was a type like right? it was a symbolic act which was actually referring to what the lord jesus would do and what would follow so um animal sacrifice everything you know associated with that do we still do it no because it ended at the cross um so uh, so so also the oil you know it was a symbol uh, it typif i mean it, it's it was symbolic of the work of the holy spirit uh -huh. so today um uh, there's no necessity for that you know we don't uh, we don't have that we don't use that uh, but the fact is that the holy spirit himself you know he is the oil of gladness you know, he does that work in us so that's why uh, so yeah the only thing that we see about oil is uh, you know what we see in james that them anoint with oil and pray and uh, it's a, again a symbolic act right so there's nothing special about the oil there's nothing magical about the oil what about baptism there's nothing special about the bath water going inside water coming out but uh, it's a symbolic of a very great spiritual truth right okay okay some more stuff. yeah 
Thank you, Nina. Um, this is covered. Yeah, thank you, Trisha. Yeah. OK, so let's, um, so we understand. We we understand, um, uh, I mean, it's, it's sometimes we, it's just, we're so humbled that the God of heaven and earth would choose to dwell in us, that the God of heaven and earth would choose to do his work in us and through us, right? So uh, and I just think about it. The God who was the Holy Spirit who was there hovering uh, over the waters at the time of creation is, is the same Holy Spirit who's indwelling us. Just think about that. So he knows everything. He's seen everything, history. He was there at the, you know, the, the early church. He came upon the disciples and, you know, birth the early church, the, the first, um, you know, the New Testament church. And he's the same Holy Spirit who's with us. And he's the spirit of wisdom. And he's the spirit of understanding. So, so the importance of us as believers for us to commune with the Holy Spirit, like we saw in our Second Corinthians, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. We really need to crave, spend time, have that communion. With the Holy Spirit, right? So um, that's something that we see. Okay, let's go to chapter four. Uh, chapter four, can, can you just tell me what is the page number? Page number nine. Okay, so let's move to uh, chapter four, and we're going to look at uh, the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the Lord Jesus. Okay, the work of the Holy Spirit in the work uh, in the life of the Lord Jesus. So we see that uh, first. We look at what was the work of the Holy Spirit, you know, um, in those events which was just leading up to His birth? Right? Um, so, work of the Holy Spirit. What was the Holy Spirit doing uh, in the events just just before um, the birth or um, you know uh, the coming of the Lord Jesus? Okay. So let's look at uh, Luke chapter one. Okay, Luke chapter one and verses fifteen to seventeen. Okay, Luke chapter 1, verse 15. Um, it is about the John, John the Baptist, and uh, the angel comes, and uh, he tells um, Zacharias, father of uh, John the Baptist. Uh, let me just read from verse 13. The angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will go. He will also go before him in the spirit of spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So this was. Uh, this is mentioned about the Holy Spirit in the life of John, and he's prophesied this is what will happen through John's ministry. He's going to prepare people uh, for, the, uh, for the Lord Jesus to come, and he's going to prepare him in this way, prepare the hearts of people in this manner, uh, because he's going to minister in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Okay, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. Okay, so we read about this about um, John the Baptist. Okay, just a minute. Um, okay. Um, okay, so uh, uh, Arya Lohe. So, so is that a question or just a you know, just a statement that you're making? Holy Spirit spoke to an individual or a group of or a group of people. Um, uh, I guess that's a that's an observation or a statement that you're making, right? If it is a question, just uh, could you please clarify, and I'll answer that, right? Okay, okay. Let's look at another um, another reference. Um, the same chapter, Luke chapter one and verse thirty-five. Okay, the angel answered and said to her, to whom? To Mary. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. And uh, you know, um, and then verse thirty-seven. Um, 
for with God nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, maid servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So in that um, that communication you know, that the angel brings this news, says that this is what will happen, uh, that Messiah will be born, and you shall name, uh, you'll, uh, you know, he shall be called this, and so on. So he says the Holy Spirit, this will be a work of the Holy Spirit. It will be a supernatural, miraculous work of the Holy Spirit. And uh, it will be the, because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, And the Holy One will be called the Son of God. So we see that this is something that he does. And this is even before the coming of the Lord Jesus. Same chapter, we go to verse 40, uh, 41. Okay. Um, so this is, this is very exciting, right? This whole chapter Luke. And we see there's so much happening. Right uh, before the birth of the Lord Jesus, there's prophesying. There's uh, Zacharias, and uh, uh, he receives. He has this vision, he, and the angel comes, and and uh, I mean visitation rather, not a vision uh, from this angel, and this happens. And then uh, Mary has this visitation of this angel Gabriel, and then you know this happens, and then Mary goes to Elizabeth. Okay, so that is what we see, and it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, that the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke out with a loved, loved voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. Right? So, like amazing things, right? Happening. If you can just picture it, you know, uh, just thinking, you know, what what was going on in Mary's mind? Right? She was troubled uh, about society and all that, but then she she just came to that point and saying, "Be it unto me according to the word of God." Now, be it unto me according to your word. Actually, the word of the angel, which was indeed the word of God. So that happens. And then she goes to visit Elizabeth. And Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. And she prophesies. Okay, and this is what she says. And, uh, you know, so no one has any clue what is happening in Mary's life. But Elizabeth prophesies by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. And, and she says, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Okay. And then she says, why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And then she testifies and says, as soon as your greeting sounded in my ears, uh, you know, she was expecting John the Baptist. She was pregnant with John the Baptist. And, the, and she says, the baby leaped in my womb as soon as your uh, greeting was here. And then verse 5, you know, she's actually confirming uh, those words that Mary actually spoke. To the angel okay what did mary say verse 38 let it be to me according to your word right she said that and here um, elizabeth is saying blessed is she who believed for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the lord so this another person you know like her own cousin elizabeth and she's like testifying and she's saying you know there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told by the lord she had no clue. She was just prophesying because of the Spirit of God. Okay, so okay, let's look at uh, verse sixty-seven. Verse sixty-seven, and we see this instance of um, incident of. Um, um, okay, uh, I'll just come back to you, Araya. Um, we see this instant uh, instance where. Um, John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, okay, so he is filled with the Holy Spirit and he prophesies. Okay, let's just read through. Let's see what he prophesies, right? And blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets who have since, who have been since the world began that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear 
in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest. Who's he talking about? Our John, right? And you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God with which the day spring from on high has visited us to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Okay, so he's just declaring, okay, this is what God is saying and he's prophesying. He's just looking at um, you know, uh, the, the baby and he's prophesying this. Okay, so again, uh, an amazing uh, thing. So we, same, same thing also, you know, for us in our day and time, we can pray, prophesy uh, over people, the heart and mind of God, and especially children, you know, prophesying the destiny that God has for them. Okay, so another question here, Holy Spirit came upon an individual or a group of people. We see both in the Old Testament and we see both, um, uh, both you know, happening that can happen. Um, so if it, particularly to the old in, in the old testament we see that uh, well we we see about okay we know that um, the holy spirit came upon you know specific individuals um, and for a specific task we we saw that and we also saw that uh, he would come upon a group of people like um, the company of prophets um, as they were coming down the high place and they were prophesying and uh, Saul joined them. He also started prophesying. So it was uh, uh, over a group of people. So it, it would happen to both uh, uh, individuals and uh, and for you know for a group. And uh, specifically in Acts chapter two, we see that the early church, about you know all the disciples were gathered together in the in the upper room, and uh, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and it was a group. And uh, well, we know that he came upon individuals also. So he would do both. Okay. Okay, Luke chapter 2, Simeon, okay, so we see um, uh, Luke chapter 2 and verse 20, 25, okay. Okay, so here's this person, Simeon, it says he was in uh, Jerusalem, he was just, he was devout, he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Uh, he was waiting for the Messiah, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Okay. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Okay. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God. Okay. So just imagine he's in the temple and... Uh, Here's this couple walking in with a child to do the custom of circumcision according to the Jewish laws, and and uh, and he, the Holy he comes into the temple by the Holy Spirit. We don't know how many people were there, how many couples were there with their children to do this, but then you know he immediately the Holy Spirit testifies to Simeon, this is the Messiah. So we don't know how many children were there, but he just goes and then he takes up the child. Uh, Jesus in his arms and blessed God and he said Lord now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word for my eyes have seen your salvation which you have pre prepared before the face of all peoples a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory uh, and the glory of your people Israel and uh, Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken uh, against. Okay. Uh, and then he says, A sword will pierce your own heart and soul also that the thoughts of many may be revealed. Okay. Referring to the sorrow that she would experience um, you know, at the crucifixion of the Lord. So, so the thing is this, you know, when we look at uh, this, we see some, some very disjoint events, but at the same time, the same Holy Spirit, you know, bringing it all together. Like there is the visitation, there is this uh, Holy Spirit coming upon Elizabeth, Mary going to visit Elizabeth, and, uh, you know, Elizabeth experiencing the baby moving at this time that Elizabeth said, I mean, Mary said, hello, and she prophesies and is saying, you know, this is the Lord, mother of my Lord who is with me. You know, very exciting things. And then they go to the temple, and here's Simeon. He's been waiting, 
and the Lord has told him, you will see, you know, you will see the Messiah before you die. And uh, there could be many people in the temple, we don't know, but then he zeroes in on this couple and this baby he takes and he says, and he prophesies right, uh, by the Spirit of the Lord. So, yeah, so all those exciting things happening. Okay, then we come to John, um, um, you know, Matthew chapter 3 and um, how the Holy Spirit is ba baptizing or the Lord Jesus is baptized by the Holy Spirit um, and uh, we, let's just read that. Okay, so it's there in Luke chapter 3 as well. Uh, okay, Luke chapter 3, verse 16. Um, John answered and saying to him, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to lose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Okay, his winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly cleanse out his threshing floor and will gather the wheat into his barn for the chaff he will burn with uh, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire and with many other exhortations he preached to the people okay, and then um, uh, it says in verse 21 when all the people were baptized it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized and while he prayed the heaven was opened and the holy spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him and a voice came from heaven which said you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Okay, if you if you just turn back to Matthew chapter three, uh, it again describes in greater detail. Right? It says um, Matthew chapter three and verse eleven it says, "I indeed um, baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire." And then on, you know, verse 12. Verse 13, then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now we, we saw this in the first chapter, right at the beginning, right? Uh, when we studied the picture of um, Trinity, the Triune God in Scripture. So we saw that. So we see that um, the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, um, baptizing the Lord Jesus coming and alighting upon him and uh, when he's baptized in water by John okay so so all these things happen in the events leading up to this the Lord Jesus is baptized with the Holy Spirit right from just before his birth um, and to the till till this instance we see the work of the Holy Spirit uh, happening there right so let's look at um, uh, the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the Lord Jesus. Okay. Um, we looked at Matthew chapter 3. If you look at Matthew chapter 4, we see that he was led by the Spirit. When Jesus it says, uh, uh, Matthew 4 and verse 1, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And then it talks about how he fasted 40 days and 40 nights and Afterwards, he was hungry, and then the temptation that he faced and over, overcame the, the work of the enemy, right? Or the temptation of the devil. Okay, then we go to Luke chapter. Any questions here? Yeah, he, he's leading him to the wilderness, and the Lord is spending time fasting and praying. And uh, we also learn a lot from that about fasting and praying, but um, specifically. Uh, it just shows us the fact that he overcame the enemy. Okay, it was a season of tempting uh, by the enemy, but it was actually um, well. Uh, it was actually the, the Holy Spirit leading him to overcome the temptation of the enemy, which is what in every time the Lord did. So it, and then it says um, when you read um, um, Matthew four. 
the angels came and tempt, um, you know, ministered to him, and it says that he returned. Which verse is that? Um, Matthew. Okay, Matthew four one. Luke four one. Let's look at Luke four one. Okay, Luke chapter four verse one. And um, sorry, not four, uh, not four one, but four fourteen. Okay, so at the end of all these temptations and Lord refuting the temptation of the enemy, verse fourteen says, "Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out throughout all the surrounding regions." Right. So the Holy Spirit led them for this specific season or a time period where he was tested, where he was tempted by the enemy. And it was an opportunity for the Lord to actually overcome. And after that, we see that he returned in the power of the Holy Spirit. And um, it was it is then that he starts his earthly ministry. And it was in the power of the Holy Spirit. And it says that news about him spread throughout, which means that his ministry of teaching, his ministry of uh, you know the supernatural works of healing, deliverance, you know everything actually happened from there because he had actually, you know, uh, broken the power of the enemy, so to speak, and he was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. So we see that the Holy Spirit led him for this specific task or these specific tasks that right just before starting the earthly ministry, and uh, it, it is so that he might win that victory. So, I mean, that's what we see in scripture, right? Okay, any other questions? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. We, like we don't know. It, uh, the Bible does not say whether he spoke in tongues or not. Um, but it also says that in the garden he prayed, and it was with him and Christ. So we don't know, you know, whether. But then, uh, but then the fact is that uh, when we look at Acts chapter, you know, Acts chapter uh, two, Acts chapter nine, Acts chapter ten, Acts chapter, you know, all those uh, uh, scriptures, we see that. For the early church, this is something that was available, and this is something for the believers, and it was for a purpose. When we study the gift of tongues, we see it was for a purpose. It was to release all the wonderful benefits of praying. I mean, one Corinthians twelve, thirteen, fourteen talks about you know the work of uh, the Holy Spirit specifically in the area of releasing gifts for the edification of the church. Um, so we see it's a good thing, right? And uh, and it has been. Uh, it is for the believer, and uh, you know John chapter fourteen and verse twelve. The Lord talks about certain things that the believers would do. Uh, he says, you know, it's it's the area of faith. He says, the works that I do, He will do also, and greater works than these you will do. Right? John chapter fourteen verse twelve. So it's not mentioned what are those great works that the believer in Jesus would do, right? Of course, it's. It's slightly out of context in the sense it's the great works. So, so you know, we can conclude that the Lord has these things in store for us, right? Um, yeah. So that's it. It's for us. It's for the church. Um, just because you don't pray in tongues doesn't make you a second-class believer. You know, the Lord still loves. The Lord still you know, the same. But it's for us. Why don't we make use? It's for us. Why don't we receive? Why do you want to refute? Right. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Anything um, online class? If you have any questions. Uh, okay. Um, so we're going to look at one more verse, like verse 14, Luke 4, verse 14. He returned in the power of the Spirit, and news of him went throughout all the surrounding. Regions. Okay, so Acts chapter ten also talks about that. 
uh, accepted 10 and verse, um, uh, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Okay, so that brings us uh, first to the understanding that okay, the Lord Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit, and he did these great and mighty works by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that's that's one. Then the second thing, second question is, okay, uh, the Lord Jesus ministered by the power of the Holy Spirit was, but wasn't he God? Right. So what? Now, you know, what's the big deal in the sense he could anyway do it? But why is it? Does it specifically say that he ministered by the power of the Holy Spirit, that he was anointed by the Holy Spirit? Now it's there for a reason, right? So let's look at that. You know the whole aspect of how Jesus ministered by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's spend, spend some time on that. So we're going to look at um, uh, you know uh, the fact that the Lord Jesus. Um, when we when we when we're going to study this, we, we're going to you know certain things we have to keep in mind. Well, the Lord Jesus was deity. Is deity. What does that mean? He's God, right? Because we we read that He is the eternal Word. Right? And everything was done by him, the whole creation. We read that Colossians one, and we you know we we read Hebrews chapter two, and we see that this is what. So that doesn't change. Okay, so he was God. He is God. He always will be. But when we look at his earthly ministry, we see that he did not walk, or he chose not to walk, in the attributes of God. Okay, so what are those attributes? He was not omnipresent. He was present in one place. Right? Omnipresent means present everywhere. But he was in this human body. He was present in that place, time, and geographical location. He was not omnipotent in the sense, in his earthly body, he was tired. He was weak. He, you know, he was hungry. So all that we see. Okay, so let's look at um, Philippians chapter 2, which explains this. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Okay. Um, so while we look at this, again, I want to repeat that. We're not saying that he, he uh, you know, at any point he was not God. Right? He, he, he was God. He, he is. He will always will be. And so we're not saying he, he stopped being God. But the fact is that this is what uh, uh, Philippians 2 says, right? Uh, let this mind, Philippians 2 and verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it, consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a born servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every other, every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Okay, So it says every knee should bow, which means worship, deity. So it's very clear. But the fact is that he made himself of no reputation. And the, and the Greek word used there is kenu, uh, kenu, uh, which means that to make empty. Okay. So he chose to sh keep aside or shed that glory of omnipotence, omniscience, right? all-knowing, all-powerful, present everywhere. As he walked as a man, as a human being, he chose to keep that aside and minister. And therefore, he had to be baptized, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So we see in the in the human body, of course, he got tired. He says, I'm hungry. He was thirsty. Um, 
you know, in his human body, he was not omnipresent. We know that he was not omniscient in the sense. Luke chapter 2 talks about how he grew in wisdom and in stature. So it was not as if the Lord Jesus, when he was born, like he was speaking fluent, you know, whatever, Aramaic or, you know, the Hebrew language. He, he grew in wisdom and stature, you know, which is tough for us to comprehend, right? Uh, you know, how can that be? So Mary must have taught him, you know, this is, hey, this is an apple, this is an orange. And he's learning those things. So the thing is that though he did not cease to be God, he chose to walk on the earth. He emptied himself, made himself of no reputation. Okay, let's read that verse again. Um, yeah, thanks, Nina. Fully God and fully man, yes. So um, let's read that verse again, right? Um, so who being in the form of God did not consider it's robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and that um, he emptied himself of, um, you know, of, of, the, or, or shed, laid aside the powers of deity, okay, as he walked on the earth, but he walked in the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, now John chapter one. We go to John chapter one and verse fourteen. Okay, let's uh, look at that quickly. John chapter one. And the word became flesh, and we, uh, and sorry, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Glory. Um, as the only begotten of the Father and uh, of the, uh, of, uh, as, as of the Son. Okay. So, what does glory mean? So we we need to understand that. What does glory mean? That's again a word that we use you know, as believers. Glory be to God. And, uh, and they just shout out excitement. Glory, hallelujah, etc. Right? So so what does glory mean? You know, that word doxa, which is used there, it just means who God is and what he does. Okay, who God is and what he does. So when we say, you know, the glory as the begotten talks about who God is and what he does, right? Let me read that verse again. And we beheld his glory. We beheld. So John is saying we saw the glory. We saw the glory of the Son. We saw who he was and what he did. We saw the glory of the Son. And he used the word doxa, which is used for, you know, for God. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, so when we say doxa, it means a manifestation, a making apparent, a display. Okay, what is a display? Okay, like in many of our homes, we have a, you know, we have a display. Right, we put all the, all the cups, medals. You know, some homes you see, you know, all the medals are there, all the cups are there. Oh, what are those? Oh, uh, my son is good in sports. This is what he won. Right? You put it on display, you put some paintings there, everything is there. It's like a museum sometimes, right? Um, so it's it's to put on display for all to see. When you put it on display, it's like to see this. So John is saying, hey, we saw the display of who this son was, son of God was. We beheld, we saw his glory as of the only begotten of God. Okay, so just, just hold on to that. Doxa, who God is and what he does. Okay. So when we when 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 we see that the Lord Jesus walked on the earth, okay, so let's go to John chapter 17. Um okay. So it says here. John chapter 17, the Lord is praying to the Father, right? Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come, glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you, as you have given him authority over all the flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is the eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, 
and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have the finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, very important, look at this verse. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Okay. So in other words, the Lord is saying, Lord, I have been walking with this, you know, if you can call it sonship glory on the earth. Now, Lord, I'm, I'm finishing the work. Glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Okay. So, so what does that mean? Sorry? Yeah. So what do we understand? We share the same glory, yes, at creation. And the Lord is very specifically saying, you know, you glorify me now. So which means that he is saying that I'm walking in a different glory now on the earth. Right? Uh, and John is also saying we beheld his glory as of the only begotten Son of God. So he's walking in what we can say, you know, a sun, as a glory of the sun or the sonship glory. Okay, who God is, a manifestation of who God is and what he does. He walking in that sonship glory, but is, is not with the glory that he had at it, uh, you know, uh, when, the, when the world was formed. Right? There's a difference, right? So he himself says it in as many words. Okay, so, um, uh, okay, let's just, let me just look at a few comments here. Ability, yeah, yeah, yeah. Basic in English is that, yeah, you know, glorify. But then you look at the, uh, this, I'm just referring to Sori's, uh, Sori Kumar's um, comments. Yeah, but when you look at the, the Greek word doxa, um, that is specifically, you know, referring to the glory uh, of God, right? Uh, a manifestation of God and his attributes, right? Okay, yeah, thank you for all those uh, comments. Okay, so um, I guess we'll stop here. And we'll continue, and you might have more questions later. But it's but it's important for us to understand, um, you know, this aspect of the ministry of the Lord Jesus, you know, which will really enable us to understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit through and to the believer as well. Okay, okay. Thank you. We'll stop here. God bless.